edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake after a Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. If this is your first time tuning in the show. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein. Two, count them two. We are that much closer to the 2024 NFL draft. So much to talk about within these next two days. There's going to be a lot of buzz throughout the draft weekend. And because it is draft week, we obviously thought to ourselves, we need to get some insider knowledge as far as what's happening in the locker room. And like I say many, many times, when Dan Wolkenstein works at the phones, great things tend to always happen. So, Dan, before we get into all this, let's talk about who is joining Chargers Unleashed today. Yes, uh, ESPN reporter, an incredible one, I might add, uh, Chris Rim has done incredible work covering the Chargers. He will be joining us to talk all things NFL Draft. We'll talk about the Jim Harbaugh, Joe Hortiz mentality, what he's predicting, some expectations, what the Chargers could possibly do at positions of need, the wide receiver versus tackle position, what they're going to do at five, possibly trade down, all of that. We'll get into all of it with Chris Rim. Um, incredible guy and excited to have him on. It's long overdue, so pumped to have him on. But Jake, before we get to that, let's pay the bills. Let's talk about our friends. I want to remind everybody of the quickest way to get into all of these sports action out there. It's Underdog Fantasy and their picking game. Just pick between two and five of your favorite or least favorite players to create a lineup and win. Take home some cold, hard cash. Underdog matches up to 500 depo- deposits, uh, $500 on your initial deposit. And just make sure when you go over there, use the promo code UNLEASHED. That's UNLEASHED. So go on over to Underdog Fantasy today and let them know that Chargers Unleashed sent you. Chris Rim from ESPN. Join us next on Chargers Unleashed. Well, the Chargers NFL draft, every NFL draft for every team starts in two days. And we have a great show lined up for you. Incredible guest, ESPN reporter, covers the Chargers. Mr. Chris Rim does it incredibly, in my opinion, by the way. Uh, Recently put out an article, really insightful, I thought, uh, outlining Hortiz and Harbaugh's draft history and what it could possibly mean for the upcoming draft. We'll put it in the description of the show, actually, for those who haven't read it, because I 10 out of 10 recommend it. Chris, excited to have you on the show, man. It's been way too long. Long time coming. Welcome. Thanks, man. Glad to be here. Of course. Of course. You can find Chris at ChrisRim1 on X, K-R-I-S-R-H-I-M-1 on X. Lots to talk about. We'll talk about kind of setting the stage here for the NFL draft, some of the biggest positions of need. The BPA versus offensive line discussion, which Chris actually talked about a bit in his article, which we'll highlight here. Harbaugh and Hortiz's mentality as well as we'll get some of Chris's expectations and predictions. But I guess, like, Chris, just to kind of set the stage here, like, the the Chargers have gone out in free agency and made a bunch of several either mid or low cost, mostly short term signings that appear to prove like real value for specific needs but also shaved a ton of cap space. You talk about like Keenan Allen and Mike Williams and a bunch of the other things that they did. A lot of free agents who are no longer on this team. How do you see those moves like signaling how this team finalizes their draft board for this week? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't look too much into those moves as far as saying, you know, maybe they're going to go away from said position because of who they sign. None of these moves really strike to me as like, okay, the chargers really, filled a, a need or something or they they're, they're good here like they're fine here outside of quarterback um and maybe yeah i don't know maybe safety i don't know um but but that's that's how i would kind of look at the the roster with these moves i think the, the moves are good they're good depth moves i think they're back everything they've said but yeah i wouldn't say it, it impacts too much um on the draft what they've done it's kind of speaking about free agency moves that have been speculated, not necessarily have taken place, but we've seen rumors and reports of the Chargers expressing interest and or meeting with the likes of Tyler Boyd, uh, Martez Valdez Scanling, DJ Chark. What do you make of those meetings? How do you see any of those possible signings playing out and maybe into what this team is going to do over the draft weekend? Yeah, well, we know, you know, I, I covered the Ravens briefly. Um, and the Ravens always are active signing players, you know, late into the season uh late into camp they're always going to be active so I, I look at those meetings as preliminary gauging gauging guys out trying to see what guys are thinking and those free agents too are waiting to see how the landscape plays out to see where they want to go especially those veteran guys to see to see what teams do with the draft how teams look so they can increase their chances 
of either winning or getting paid the most money they can. Um, so I, I would say for those situations, they're encouraging. And it's, it sounds like to me that, that you know, Joe Ortiz and the Chargers are setting themselves up to be in line to sign some of these players after the draft once they have things better settled, you know, with the roster. And we all know how unpredictable the NFL draft could be. Even with the Chargers sitting at five, there's just so much intrigue and mystery as far as how the board's going to fall, what they're ultimately going to do. The Charger, This Chargers team still needs to build out a ton of depth on both sides of the football. And in order to turn it into what Joe Hortiz and Jim Harbaugh envision for this team, what two or three positions do you feel are the most important for this team to come away with draft weekend to say they have to come away with X and Y in order to consider this draft to be a success? Yeah, I mean, I think with as far as position goes, I think you want to come away wherever it is. You want to come away with a receiver you feel really good about. In my in my opinion, wherever that is, um, I, I would I would go there. I think, and I would say for two and three, you would also. I, I also like them coming out of this draft with a cornerback and with an interior lineman. Um, I think those three <laughs> would be the ones I immediately think about um, with the Chargers. Like that, that's what you. That's what I would do if I was if I was them. I want to touch on that real quick, the the fact, because Dan and I have been saying the exact same things in terms of where wide receiver corner is positioned in this draft as far as, you know, need and how big it is considering the depth. I feel like interior defensive line is a position that has kind of been, you know, put on the back burner given the needs above it currently as it stands right now. And we know that then when you start looking at the depth chart, obviously the Chargers went out and signed Puna Ford and uh, you still have some other returning players in there as well with Scott Matlock and Tito. But in terms of what Jesse Minter and this defense want to run. If you were going to be putting a a priority on interior defensive linemen as to say day two, day three, what seems like the most realistic option in terms of how the board might fall? Yeah. I mean, as far as players, it's, I try to stay away from like the mock and who goes where, right. I mean, I think a lot of people are looking at like Chris Jenkins or any, any Michigan guy really like, you know, as far as like where they're going to go. Um, but I think if, if I had to like project it, I would, as far as investment wise, I guess in my mind, I think like what you said, like day two investment kind of player, if that, that's kind of like running around your question. Right. But that's like investment into a player. I think a day two investment into that interior defensive line is what I would do. Like get a guy who you feel like could be a contributor legitimately this year for, I think a position that's, that that is a, a legitimate weak spot for this team, you know, but they have the edge rushers and you know how Minner wants to play this play this defense. We'll talk about right. interior offensive line and offensive line in general here in a second. But like you know this team and you know Joe Hortiz and the Ravens and kind of the the defense with Minter and Mike McDonald, kind of the same pedigree. Um not necessarily specific people, but the archetype of corner that you think that this Chargers team could be looking for. Like what could you foresee this team looking for in terms of traits that they see in corners that would fit this defense? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, everybody wants those long arm, uh, you know, lanky, fast, uh, you know, kind of can bump you and run with you type of cornerbacks. And if, I mean, if you look at, you know, who the Ravens have had, right. Even recently it's this uh, Marlon Humphrey, you know, it's, uh, you know, Brandon Stevens, it's uh it's guys that can get into you, um, guys that can also tackle. Um, so that's what I that's what I think that the Chargers are looking for. They're looking for corners that can that can cover, but corners that can also tackle. Which I think, as we know, you know, <laughs> the Chargers could use so you know some of both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So um, all right, let's let's flip to the topic that probably has um, most Chargers fans kind of in arms with each other and it's kind of about like the number five overall and just kind of like the the chasm between best player available and possibly what this team might want to do in terms of like fit and need and this kind of goes a little bit towards your article that you wrote this past week but like so many are hoping for wide receiver at five overall if they stay at five but we've also heard how important protecting the quarterback and establishing the run is for the staff But we've also heard Joe Hortiz talk and prove through his time in Baltimore, his emphasis on going best player available. This feels like 
that's what the fans and most pundits like see. And that's why they're so split on what they could or should do in the draft. Like, how do you decipher Ortiz and Harbaugh's process based on what you've heard from the team and the coaching staff and players and everything that you know there so far on how like they're going to continue to build the team through the draft? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, again, you know, people this time of year, you know, they're going to try their best to keep everything in house and try their best to say all the right things about, and everyone really kind of goes best player available, says they go best player available for the most part. And I think the Ravens mostly did that um, in Baltimore, but there are some years, I mean, even last year, right? Like when they drafted Zay Flowers, was he the best player available? Maybe. Um, but there was a there was a run on receivers and they knew they they needed a receiver. So they got a receiver. Right. So it's like, yeah, they, they want best player available more often than not. And you have to like when they got Kyle Hamilton, like like Joe said. Or, right. So I do think that the the uh, the idea that the Chargers are going to go O-line isn't a true one. Like like they're locked into that at five. It isn't true because of what they've said. So many people think because they've talked about how much they want to build the run game and how much they're like Jim Harbaugh has talked about this and that. Um, I just think he's that, that Harbaugh for one is a little, he just loves football, right? He's just a little, he's a little bit, uh, he's a little bit off like all these, all these coaches, right? Like he just loves football. He just loves running the ball. And that's like, that's what he does. Right. Like, I don't think it doesn't mean like we're gung ho. We have to get alignment. And to be frank, like the, the chargers, I know there's the, when we talk about line, we're talking about tackles and we're talking about Trey Pipkins. And, and, you know, when you look at, at Trey Pipkins, right, you know, his game fluctuates, right. You know, he, you know, he's, in, he's been a little bit inconsistent, but you would, I don't think you, you look at him and you say like, he's, he's like an immediate, like we can't run him out there next year to be the starter. And it kind of feels like that sometimes, you know, how the discussion is going. Right. Um, so yeah, when you look back at their drafts and you look at what they've done, They've often gone best player available, even in even in San Francisco, when, when Jim had a similar situation where the left side of his line was pretty much solid. The right side of his line was kind of middling um, average, average kind of players. Right. I mean, they you know chose safety, chose a receiver. So, yeah, I, I would lean on that. And um, just they're going to pick the guy they feel is the best, especially with this roster. We're talking to Chris Rev, ESPN reporter for the Chargers. And so you mentioned kind of interior offensive line being one of the biggest positions of need and i'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of the offensive line struggled last year and there was a lot impacted both like the run and the pass game across the line which is honestly probably why most people who are saying charge to go offensive line and it's probably tackle at five it's probably why that narrative has like picked so much steam is because of that but like based on what you've seen and what you've heard like where along the offensive line is there the biggest opportunity for actual improvement? Like they got Bozeman, like they have the interior offensive line, but I think that needs help. You mentioned it's a top three. Trey Pipkins, you could probably say like his average, you can go a little above or below depending on it. Like how do you see the team aiming to solve the offensive line struggles as a whole? Yeah. I mean, I think a big part of the struggle, well, it's not a big part of the struggles, but when you look at the line play, like from, from Rashawn down, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't a great year for any, for, for really, uh, you know, most of the line in, in, in my vantage point. Right. And Rashawn said that as much, you know, throughout the year, he was just like, I wasn't, I wasn't where I should have been. I wasn't playing how I should have played. Um, and then there was also so many injuries on the line, right. You know, down to the third string center by the end of the year. I think for me, when I look at the, the, the line, one of the things that I do look at as a player like Zion, you know, like Zion Johnson, I think he's, he has such high potential when he came in. There's so much excitement about him, right? And then last year, um, you know, where, where you know, he, he's kind of – what I noticed with him mostly was, like, struggling to getting to kind of that second level of, of the defense, right? Like getting to, you know, maybe the linebackers when we're blocking or th things like that. I mean, that, and that's kind of what you hear when you – not just him, but that's kind of what you hear when you talk about this line and when you look at the numbers, right? I think they were, they were something like 1.8 yards before contact – um in in uh last season at some point so i think with this line it's like you have the players you have a lot of talent and vets i think coaching is really important and you know they brought in a bunch of people with experience so yeah i think i think they're they're in an all right spot that was 
I'm so glad you brought this that last part of it in terms of coaching goes because in relation to the Trey Pipkins narrative and like you were mentioning, you know, it's serviceable. You know, he's not a yeah. he's not a terrible right tackle, and obviously he's he was one year into a three year uh, deal thus far. And in terms of coaching, I feel like is going to bridge so much of the gap, not just on the offensive line, but at multiple different positions this year. Just in terms of with Trey and the revamping of the coaching staff that has now been brought in to head up the offensive line and obviously improve it as a whole. What do you think that their ultimate plan is for him? Is, 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 I mean, do you, in your opinion, do you see them going into this next year with, to say, you know, Trey Pipkins is going to be the right tackle to start. And obviously we would figure that they would revamp the offensive line one way or another, adding some more depth pieces to it. But in right. your opinion, do you feel, feel like that is legitimately what they're thinking with this new coaching staff? Well, I would assume so. Yes. But I would, I would say I expect them to bring in competition. Like I would, I wouldn't say that they they would go. You know, we're we're just gonna peg him in, and we're not gonna bring in any competition for that spot. Like they're, you know, even in Baltimore's, you know, open competition kind of everywhere. Um, obviously, without without the, you know, we you know Lamar Jackson or Justin Herbert. Uh, but but yeah, so I, I would expect it to be competition for Trey. But like you said, he's yeah, he's not. It's almost like like he's not a terrible player. Like <laughs> and and it, it kind of seems like that has been where this has gone because of. Um, how much they've talked about the running game and the offensive line. But yeah, he, he can play. Chargers recently brought in and signed uh, running back J.K. Dobbins, which the timing of it was a little bit of a surprise. Dan and I had talked about this uh, back when they were first bringing him in for meetings. And in just in general, obviously, now that running back room is comprised of Gus Edwards, J.K. Dobbins, Isaiah Spiller, uh, Elijah Dodson. How much of an impact do you think? I know that, that you had said at the beginning of all this that it doesn't necessarily eliminate them going after any of these positions, but how do you think that them now bringing in two former Baltimore Ravens running backs, how do you think that that ends up impacting that position room? Does it maybe move the position priority down in terms of when they might end up selecting a running back to round out this group? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know some people were – we're stressing, thinking, you know, what if they take Blake Corum like second round or something? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would, I would say for sure, like that whole, and that's what I mean when we say, like at the press conference, uh, Joe said the that signing J.K. doesn't change anything about the draft approach. But again, the at this time of year, you say what you have to to say what you have to. <laughs> I, I ultimately, it cha- yeah, it has to change, right? Like you, you, you feel good about that. You, you kind of feel all right with that room, like you, you know. So it has to move the. It has to move running back down a bit, right? Regardless of what's said publicly, I, I think it definitely probably moves it down a bit. Not to say that they won't get someone, but moves it down in priority wise. Let's say that the Chargers stick and pick at five, and Marvin Harrison Jr isn't available which remaining wide receiver do you feel fits this team this coaching staff and just their overall need now that keenan allen and mike williams are no longer on this roster yeah i mean i i really i really do like malik neighbors i think he is uh potential <laughs> let's I go think, chris let's go <laughs> i think yeah uh, yeah i i think he has a potential to be you know one of those guys right and um put him in this offense and i think you're cooking with something exciting and and i, I don't know I, I think there's a lot to like about neighbors i think there's a lot to like about you know marvin harrison jr but i don't when you talk to people around the league too and this has come out publicly with reports right like the i think for a lot of um, scouts and, and evaluators, the the gap between neighbors and and Marvin isn't significant for for a lot of scouts. And and some people have neighbors over Marvin Harrison Jr. And I don't know if that's you know the the majority, but a lot, some people do, right? So so I think neighbors. If if the Chargers landed neighbors as a fan, I think people should be really excited because he's dynamic. And I was going to ask you, and there's been a lot of people, and I we've talked about this where you know, maybe from like a fit perspective. And maybe this is like the the thinking back in like the Telesco era of like how they go for certain types of receivers, what would best fit the team versus like breaking the mold. And we've talked a bit about like a Day or Marvin Harrison Jr. maybe being like the better fit for this Chargers team. 
in terms of like being an X receiver now that Keenan Allen isn't there and Mike Williams isn't there. But then like we started thinking about like, okay, well maybe that's not the fit that they want. And maybe they want that like guy who's just a disruptor, who's the cheat code, who can just put, you know, defenses in like maximum conflict. Like, do you think they have a type of receiver they're looking for? I think the type is less about the build and the, and more about the mentality, right? Like I think the, the type of receiver they're looking for is just like, like a dog, right? Like, like someone totally neighbors, that is totally neighbors. Like someone, someone who is confident, who is not afraid of contact, who's not afraid to ball. Um, I think that's who they're looking for. Right. Cause you look at the receivers that, right. Like even last year, right. Like the, the uh the I keep going back to this, but they drafted, you know, Zay Flowers, right? Like Zay Flowers is is like five eight. Um like you know, like he, he he's like five eight, like one eighty, right? Like this is not a an X or anything like that, but you you know he he kind of plays like it, right? Like you don't have to be you don't have to be that big, especially in today's game, right? Like the game has changed so much. Um you you know going back to the fit and all of that. I think the fit is more about I think Jim Harbaugh says this often like we want your play to talk so much that we can't even hear what you're saying. So that, that's what it comes down to. I think it's less about the the play style being the fit and more of a the player's mentality. And we've heard like a lot about this team talking about like they want like I'm paraphrasing, but like they want a little bit of crazy. Like they don't want they want the guys who are just you mentioned like they want the dogs. They want the ones who are going to go out there and just like play with the hair on fire mm-hmm. and like back it up and like that screams Mark, like Malik neighbors. Like you see him with like that chip on his shoulder on like everything. And he just finds slight in any little thing that people say. And I, I don't know. I just, I was thinking about like the fit thing and I'm like, maybe they don't have a fit. Like maybe that's not even the fit that we're thinking of. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't look too much into Yeah. Right. Like when we're, when we're talking about play style, right. Like I think it's more about that, like get a guy that can do it and it, we'll, we'll figure it out. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, okay, we'll round it out here. Um, we always like to, especially during draft season, we like to get kind of predictions or expectations for how folks think the Chargers are going to end up drafting. Mm. And I know you didn't, you're not, you weren't big in looking at all the specific players, which is totally fine. Honestly, it's probably smart because there's like 500 of them. <laughs> but whether that is players or whether that is positions, okay, give us your prediction for how things will go in round one. And then maybe we'll just stick to round one and day two. Okay. That could be player. It could be scenario, trade down, trade up, whatever. Yeah. What are your expectations and predictions for days one and two? So I think there's actually an ESPN mock draft running tonight on TV. Um, So this is, I think that the, and maybe I'm just buying into the, the JJ McCarthy hype, but I think the Chargers will trade back with Minnesota. I think they'll get, Two first. I don't think they'll get three first. I'm gonna get two first. Uh, uh, a day two pick next year, or a day, or my my trade specifically in the ESPN one is two first, a fourth this year, and a three next year. Um, so I think they could get something like that. I don't think they would get three first, but I think they could get a package like that. And I think if they get that package, they go. I think they go unless Brock Bowers is on the board at eleven. They go O line at eleven, then they go corner. Unless maybe a guy like Brian Thomas Jr. is there or something or someone I don't know, but I think they go corner and then they go receiver second round. So I would I would, I would predict that uh, if they trade, I would I predict trade down lineman corner receiver second round. But in the ESPN draft, I go lineman receiver. So don't get on me for that. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different ways that they can go, honestly. And that's what yeah. makes this draft specifically with Joe Hortiz and Jim Harbaugh the helm so intriguing for the Chargers. Yeah. And I will say, I, went, I will just say, I went receiver because the corners that I had in mind had gone. So I, I, I went receiver. That, that's what had happened. Yeah. Man, so much I think excitement and hype, and I think just like nervousness in the new era of Chargers hey, football. Let me, let me ask, what what do y'all think? What, Jake, you, what was yours? What do y'all think? I mean, I I think it would ultimately end up being a trade down to eleven twenty three uh, to acquire that. 
if it was me, my board would actually flip to putting pri- uh, priority at corner at, with 11. So depending yeah. on how the board is, it's either Terry on Arnold, it's Quinion Mitchell there. Then yeah. I would probably come around with 23. And depending on who, which wide receiver was on the board, I'd probably go that route. 37. I'm really bullish on Zach Frazier. I just love him as a, as a center prospect, and I've seen mock drafts out there with them possibly using 37 uh, for a center prospect. So, again, there's so many different ways they could go. Linebacker is, an, is another even sneaky option that they could do at 37 there. So yeah. lots of possibilities. Definitely. Uh, for those viewing, my cat was going absolutely ballistic, so I had to like go off screen for like three seconds, let the cat out of the room, so I apologize. Um, so I've been on record. Like, I have – I feel like I have been like the leader of the, of the Malik neighbors caboose since like December. <laughs> and he's legitimately my favorite player of this entire draft class. I can't remember the last time, probably since Jamar chase that I've seen a receiver that I like as much as him. Uh-huh. And I go back and forth on like, if they would go neighbors or Marvin Harrison jr. And I think they would probably go Marvin Harrison jr. They being the chargers. But if he's not there, the Chargers have to stick at five. I'm praying to all things. Holy. <laughs> that they go Malik neighbors. Like, I just think that would be an absolute cheat code. Yeah. Um, and the most likely scenario is like, as much as I would love to see Minnesota trade down and give the hall. Like I just, I've said to Jake before, like, I just don't think that this quarterback class, like this QB four is worth trading all of those assets. I mean, if they want to do it, sweet, I'm down. Right. I just don't know if they would do it, but Hey, maybe they love him. Maybe he's their QB too. Um, if they trade down, though, I think it's like full on offensive line. I wouldn't be shocked at all. all right. I think most most fans probably would be totally fine with offensive line anywhere but five. Um, right. <laughs> and it's just anywhere but five. That's the issue because yeah. I think yeah. you think BPA. There's no way that's not one of those receivers. But uh, yeah, I would probably say they stick at five. I'm gonna say Malik Neighbors. I'll be doing cartwheels to Jake's house with a lot of shots and something. Uh, <laughs> And then day two, like if they don't leave day him. two without at least a like they have to get a corner because like this cornerback room is absolutely like non-existent, especially on the outside, honestly. Like you're praying that Christian Fulton becomes some incredible player that he was three years ago, and you're playing that Asante Samuel Jr. can actually be an outside corner. Like those are tough odds. So cornerback, neighbors, and then if they trade back. I mean, I can almost guarantee you it's going to be tackled, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, that sounds, that sounds good. I like it. I like that for both of you. Oh, man. Um, Chris, you've been awesome, dude. I appreciate you taking the yeah. time to come out here and do this with us. Uh, what should Chargers fans expect from you? What are you working on between now and the rest of the week as the draft unfolds? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, happy to be on. And, uh, yeah, I was working on – got the mock draft running on ESPN tonight. I'm not sure what time, but it will be on TV at some point where – you know, all the 32 reporters, we make our picks and I kind of leaked it here, my, my picks. But uh, yeah, I think for me, uh, you should expect a couple features running, you know, after the draft. Obviously, I'll have some post draft stuff on whoever they pick and then, you know, some stuff leading into the year uh, and some national stuff. So just keep be on the lookout. It should be an exciting year for everybody in the hardball era. I love it. Chris Rim, everybody you can again, you can find Chris. Crisp, Chris on X at Chris Rim one K R I S R H I M one. Again, I'll leave the link to your latest article, Chris, in the description for, for folks who have not already seen it. Definitely recommend watching or reading that one before the draft starts, so you can guys put your minds at ease a bit. Um, Chris, you've been awesome, man. Appreciate you coming on. You're a friend of the show. Welcome anytime. All right. Thank you, y'all. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, Chris.